Was this like when I was uh, in, uh, I forget where it was, it was some country, I wanted to get a Diet Coke. And this you know, refrigerator was Diet Coke's right there, but I'm not allowed to touch it. So I have to ask this one person who also is not allowed to touch it, but that person can then like call in a supervisor or something who's actually allowed to get it out and then bring it, it's a very complicated process. Uh, right, anyway. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna finish with the uh, Morse theory and then try to get on to some things which are involve holomorphic curves and are related to the polyfold foundations of SFT, which we'll be hearing about next week. So the more theory example I had um, was you have uh, FTGT is a one parameter family of pairs of a function at a metric on a manifold. Um, and at time t equals zero, this fails to be more smale. So at time t equals zero, there is a index zero flow line from a critical point Q to a critical point R. So these both have index I. We'll call this thing U zero. Um, but we'll assume that it's a sort of generic situation. When I say the word generic, that means satisfying various conditions which hold for data in a countable intersection of open dense sets. And the set of conditions may increase as I go along. Um, so, so here, the, um, uh, so the linearized operator for this U0 is not surjective, but by the generic case, it's, uh, it's co-kernel um, is one dimensional. Um, and um, the other generic thing is you can look at the um, derivative of the gradient flow equation with respect to t on u0. Um, so if I look at sort of d dt of the gradient flow equation is ds minus v on u0, then this derivative at t equals zero should have a non-zero projection onto this co-kernel. So this is an isomorphism. So this is the, the generic way in which an index zero thing can appear in a one-parameter family. And then for, for t non-zero but small, this will actually be more small. Um, yeah, it could be, it could be real valued or circle valued. It doesn't really make a difference for this discussion. So, so if you're more comfortable with real valued, let's say it's real valued. That's an assumption. I guess. What's an assumption? This, the, the derivative. Yeah. So these are assumptions. So every this whole board is assumptions. And then, what I want to analyze is what is the change in the chain complex as we go from negative t to positive t. So in particular, if I have... Are you assuming that there's only one flow line from Q to R, or...? Yeah, so just, just this one failure of, of more smaleness arises at time zero, which is this one index zero flow line appears. Okay, and let's say I have another flow line, P of index I plus one, excuse me, another critical point, P of index I plus one, and a flow line U plus from P to Q, um, then we have a configuration like this at time zero. Um, and I could say, well, for, so, the, so we expect that this can be glued to an actual flow line from P to R for time small, maybe positive, maybe negative. So you want to analyze when that can happen. So in the last time we wrote down the equations for this, um, so we, we have gluing parameters R, which is very large, and T, which where the absolute value of T is, well, T is non-zero, but its absolute value is small. Um, 
And what we do is we uh, translate these flow lines. So, so the, my maps are all parameterized. So u plus is a map from r to x. And u0 is a map from r to x. So the first thing we do is we translate these. So we, we move u plus up by r over 2. We move u0 down by r over 2. And to the great confusion of everyone, last time I continued to denote u plus and u0 by the same letters. So I've tr I'm translating them, but denoting them by the same letters. Okay. So, so we translate u plus up, u0 down. Up and down means 0 is close to q or far from q? Mm -hmm. The image of 0 will be? Uh, the image of 0 will be far from q. Okay. So, we're, so this is breaking. I mean, the, the inverse of gluing is breaking. And what's breaking? So you have a flow line like this for some non-zero time. And when it's close to breaking, what it does, well, actually, I'm going to have my things going up. So it goes, it goes up from R, and it's near Q, and then it just sits there for a really long time. And then it goes up to P. So it's like, the, the sort of, it's like a camel with two humps where there's some action happening. And these two humps are getting ripped apart. That's why you talk about breaking. It's very dramatic. <laughs> What? Um, it's a tofu camel. <laughs> no animals are harmed in this talk. <laughs> okay. All right, so we translate by this, um, and then we're going to change the time to t, okay? Um, so I mean, with the equation, I guess I should put a t here. So vt means the, the upward gradient vector field for time t. Um, and then we have uh, psi plus and psi 0. So these are um, perturbations of the uh, uh, u plus and u minus. So psi plus is a section of u plus star tx. And psi 0 is a section of u0 star tx. Um, and then we had a, we looked at um, beta plus times u plus plus psi plus um, plus beta 0 times u0 plus psi 0, where beta plus and beta 0 are cutoff functions um, as derivatives of, of order 1 over r. And this, this expression really means you start with u plus and you apply the exponential map to psi plus. Um, and then I, I, choose, I choose some coordinate shard in the neighborhood of q such that where both of these cutoff functions are non-zero, it makes sense to add them like this. Um, and then the gluing equation, so if we could call this whole thing, let's call this uh, capital U. So this is, so this is um, map from r to x. And then we have the equation for this to be a flow line. So we have ds plus vt of u uh, has the form uh, beta plus times theta plus uh, psi plus psi minus t plus beta 0 times theta 0 of psi, sorry, this is not minus, it's 0 psi plus psi zero t, where um, does that go to the right place? Yeah, but you can't see it. Okay. Um, so then we're, we're uh, theta plus is the uh, linearized operator for u plus applied to psi plus. Um, plus um, uh, d beta 0 ds times uh, u0 plus psi 0 plus some other stuff which doesn't really matter, so I'm not going to write it. Um, and then uh, theta 0, well, I guess. I could write this here, although it's not going to matter, but, but we have sort of the um, plus the 
the derivative of the, well, plus t times the uh, derivative of v with respect to t because the, the equation's changing because the vector field is changing. Well, and I guess it's ds minus v, so I should put a minus sign here. And then there's some sort of error terms. And then theta zero is d zero psi zero plus d beta plus ds u plus plus psi plus uh, minus t times partial vt partial t plus some error terms. And then there were some lemmas. So the lemma So let's fix r and t, where r is sufficiently large and the absolute value of t is sufficiently small. Um, and then there exists a unique uh, psi minus, or so, sorry, psi plus and psi zero, such that um, psi plus is L2. And this is, this is unique, and you have to work in some Bono space where these things are required to decay. Um, um, and then it's unique such that psi, psi plus is L2 orthogonal to the kernel of D plus. Psi zero is L2 orthogonal to the kernel of D zero. Um, and theta plus is equal to zero. Um, and theta zero, I can't quite get it to be zero, but I can get it to be uh, L2 orthogonal to the image of the operator D zero. Okay. So if I could actually get theta zero equal to zero, then I would have a gluing because the, um, that whole expression up there would be equal to zero. I can't quite do it. There's a failure which is this theta zero. So it, you can think of theta zero as living in the co-kernel of D zero, which is a one-dimensional vector space. So I have an obstruction to gluing, which lives in a one-dimensional vector space. So when that obstruction is zero, this construction will work and I can glue. Um, and some people asked me last time, why do we want theta plus and theta zero both to equal zero? We just need this linear combination of them to equal zero. And the answer is because then you get this uniqueness of psi plus and psi zero. And, and as Helmut pointed out to me after the talk, this is quite analogous to the anti-gluing in polyfolds. You want to make the gluing um, unique or, or make it an isomorphism by including this, keeping track of this anti-gluing. So, so by making both of these equal to zero, it's like analogous to saying that I'm, I'm making the anti-gluing equal to zero. Okay, so now we have an obstruction bundle picture. So this is the general picture so in our particular case, we have a bundle over the set of all pairs R and T. It's a trivial bundle. It's, it's just that the fiber over any point is the co-kernel of that operator D0. So this is, this is some one-dimensional vector space. Um, and we have a section of this bundle. So S of RT is defined to be theta zero, the theta zero provided by this lemma. So we try to glue, maybe it doesn't quite work. So as I learned, um, the way mathematicians can be successful is when you, you turn failure into success by calling it an obstruction and writing a paper about obstruction theory. <laughs> um, so, so that's the obstruction. Um, and then this construction defines a map from the zero set of S to the set of, of gluings, the set of flow lines that are close to breaking. Um, and then a non-trivial fact, which I won't attempt to explain here, that this is a homeomorphism. Okay, so um, all, this, all, all gluings can be obtained by this construction, and this does a bijection. Right. So then, well, that's nice, but then we have to understand what is this section. Okay. And then the trick for that is we're going to approximate it by a different section. 
So let's, let's try to understand what's going on here. So, um, so let's, let's look at this, this expression for theta zero. Now, so S, S of RT, to be a little more precise, is the projection of theta zero onto the co-kernel of D zero. Right? So this first term is in the image of D zero, so it doesn't 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 come up at all. Um, and I've got this term which measures the derivative of the equation. That's going to stay there. Um, this psi plus, it turns out this psi plus is very small. It's much smaller than everything else. And the reason why, so I didn't draw the picture of the cutoff functions, but the cutoff functions look like this. So here is you know s, here's r over 2, here's minus r over 2. So so beta zero is sort of going like that, um, and beta plus is going like this. So we could make it so that the, the region where it's actually getting cut off, let's say this goes from, say, r over 6 to r over 3. Okay. Um, so this is minus r over 6 and minus r over 3. Okay. And then if you look at this equation, the other equation for theta plus, this thing is actually equal to zero. Um, and um, the upshot is that um, away, from, away from this region, where, where the derivative of beta zero is, is non-zero, psi plus satisfies an equation which forces it to exponentially decay as you go um, this way. Right. So, so psi plus is something over here, but then it, it, has, it has time r over 3, which is a very large amount of time, to exponentially decay before it gets over there. So the psi plus that you see here is heavily exponentially decayed, so it sort of doesn't matter much. So this, this let's, let's ignore that. Um, there's some other stuff here, and let's ignore that too. Um, and then... This is awesome math. <laughs> what? So then we have an approximate section, and then this u plus, we can also simplify that a little bit. Um, because um, well, we have to think about the asymptotics of u plus. So before translating, uh, for t, for t sort of very negative, uh, u plus, sorry, not t, s. What is u plus of s? Well, it's approximately e to the minus, and which way is it going to go? Uh, this has nothing to do with the This has nothing, to, I'm just talking about Morse theory right now. Oh, that, oh, shit. This is supposed to be a fractor S. Uh, <laughs> Actually, if I do this, it's going to give me an error, and it's going to tell me I have to use math frac. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, there's not enough letters. You'd think with a Greek financial crisis, they could sell us some letters for cheap. <laughs> so it seems like they already did that. And all the other letters look the same as Roman letters, so we're out of luck. Um, <laughs> I have to import some letters from somewhere else. Uh, OK. So, so this is going to look like minus uh, this is, I have my reasons for writing it like this. Uh, uh, so this were, so generically, so we're adding conditions to the generically. So, so lambda minus 
is the smallest positive eigenvalue of the Hessian. at the point P. I put a minus here because it's associated to the negative end of the flow line. Um, I guess I don't need an absolute value sign because it's positive. Um, and, and, and eta is some eigenfunction. And I'm going to assume also, it just add to my assumptions that, um, let's, let's assume that the eigenvalues of the Hessian are all distinct. Q, H of Q. So this is Q, it's not P. Okay, so that's what that's what it looks like. Um, and then after translating, well, well, okay, so now we have to we have to pair this with a co-kernel, but we've translated by total translation distance of R. So the upshot is that this this D beta plus DS times u plus, when I, when I project this to the co-kernel, this is approximately e to the minus lambda minus r times some number. So I can think of eight as a, as a number. Well, well it's some, or just it's some fixed element in the co-kernel. So, so it decays like this, okay? Yeah? Is that eigenfunction set the one corresponding to the eigenvalue, or? I shouldn't have said eigenfunction because it's just an eigenvector. This is this is just freaking vector space here. Okay, I, I'm sorry. So a is an eigenvector corresponding to this eigenvalue. Sorry, I, I said eigenfunction because I'm really thinking about holomorphic curves. This is just a model case for holomorphic curves. All right, and then I'm gonna to make things the equations a little simpler. Um, let's. Uh, I know the derivative of the equation at u0 is an isomorphism to the co-kernel, and let's use this map to, to identify the co-kernel with r. Okay? So this eta is actually just a real number now. And, and generically, it's going to be non-zero. And then, so I can define this, what's in, in our, the paper with Tobbs, it's called the linearized section. And linearized is not really a very apt word because it has nothing to do with linear or nonlinear. It's just a sort of leading order approximation to the section. And I'll call it S0. So S0 of RT is, uh, it's now e to the minus lambda minus R uh, times eta minus T. That's my section. Um, and then the, the next fact you need um, let's put it this way so for for a fixed T the number of zeros of the actual section counted with say Z mod 2 or counted with signs is equal to the number of zeros of this linearized section another fact which I, there's a, if you want to do this carefully, there are a billion technical things you need to check. So another, another you know, fact you can check is that S is smooth uh, and generically S is transverse to the zero section. Okay. So if I want to, so the upshot is that if I want to count the number of gluings, I have to count the number of zeros of this thing. But this is now quite simple. This is just an exponential times a constant minus t. Not very complicated. So we can put together the conclusion from this. So the conclusion is that, um, so if eta and t have opposite signs, Um, well, then you're in big trouble uh, because there's no way this can ever be zero. 
So then you can't glue. Um, and if eta and t have the same sign, then there's a unique solution R. So to the equation S0 of RT equals zero. So the number of gluings is equal to one. And probably with a little more work, you could show that, actually, that there's actually just one gluing. There's no cancellation, right? So this is sort of what we expected to get. We expected that you would be able to uh, glue this configuration for either positive time or negative time or not both, and that's what we found. And the analysis actually tells us whether T will be positive or negative. To figure it out, you have to look at the asymptotics of um, U plus, and you have to pair that with a, uh, um, well, with the um, derivative of the equation. So you can work, so it tells us completely explicitly um, for, which, for, for which sign of T you will get a gluing. Any questions about this? So I'm about to make it harder. So. Can you say a little bit more what goes into this second fact that the number of zeros is the same? Um, well, basically, you need to show that the things that I casually crossed off are small. So basically there's, there's some, you're sort of restricting attention to some set of R and T, and you want to show that as you deform S to S0, no zeros of the section can escape outside of the boundary of this region. And to do that, you need to show the boundary of this region, the, the S0 is very big, and the stuff that I threw away is very small, so it can never vanish. How much more complicated does it get if you have a curve from, if you're in the S1? Well, I'm about to get to that. Okay. There is a, another generosity condition because you're assuming that the eigenvalues of HQ um, somehow project non, the, the top, the eigenvalue, cor the, the eigenvector corresponding to the lowest eigenvalue has a non-zero projection to the cocoa, right? Because you're assuming that the projection of eta um, I'm just um, yes, okay, so there's something I forgot to say. This is not a genericity assumption. Um, it turns out that if you look at a co-kernel element, you can identify it with, with an element of, you can el identify it with the element of the kernel of the formal adjoint. And if you look at the asymptotics of an element of the kernel of the formal adjoint, it has exactly the same asymptotics as this, this um, flow line U plus. So, the, so the, the, the leading eigen, well I guess, okay, I guess that's something one needs to check. But I think one can just prove that probably. Well anyway, there's, there's, if you look at the asymptotics of the co-kernel element, it has a leading term, which has the same form as the, this, this, uh, this uh, leading term over here. So I guess maybe we might need to, it might be a generosity assumption to say that that's not zero. In the holomorphic curve case, it actually, yeah, you're right. We maybe need to assume that. I'm sure it works exactly the same. What? It? I'm sure it works exactly the same as the holomorphic curve case. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's an additional genericity assumption, which uh, probably most people in the audience got lost and don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so there's, there's some additional genericity assumption in there. So it's, it's basically saying that the, the flow line is approaching the critical point with the, the slowest possible asymptotic behavior. Right, I was assuming that about U plus, but I'm also assuming something about the co-kernel of U0. Yeah, because you're assuming that the projection onto the co-kernel of U0 is not zero, right? So you get this number, U plus. Yes. Which is, you know, yes. yes. Right. right, so that'll be true if the sort of leading asymptotics behaves in a generic way. Right. I think I'm going to not go explain that point more just to, That's fine. But, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I forgot to mention that. All right. Other questions about this? 
Yeah. There's some more orientation of the pixel because if you identify it with power and then the sign matters. All right, so I'm, I, I'm choosing an identification in which this thing is identified with one. Okay, so, so the derivative of the equation at u0 is some element of the non-zero element of the co-kernel. I'm just going to call it one. So I did that just to simplify the equations. Otherwise, I'd have to sort of, instead of thinking of these as real numbers, I'd have to think of them as co-kernel elements and use more notation. All right, well, let's, let's up the difficulty level just a little bit. Where's the hook? Oh, it's hiding. Ugh. I need a hook to get the hook. Okay. Oof. Come on. Yeah, I probably did. So, I probably planned this poorly. <laughs> it's too too complicated. I was trying to do it so that the boards wouldn't have the shadow on them, but. Uh. <sighs> right, so. The next example is let's say we're in this S1 valued case. So there can be an index zero flow line from Q to itself. So here P is index I plus one, Q is index I. There's a at time T equals zero, there's a flow line from Q to itself. So I, I already know how to glue this because it's the same analysis I just did. But maybe what if we want to glue to two copies of the flow line from Q to itself, okay? So, so at time t equals zero, I have this configuration, and we could say if t is non-zero but close to zero, does there exist a flow line which is obtained by gluing these three things together? So maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, we can use a similar analysis. So in this situation, there are, there are three gluing parameters. Because t is as before, I'm just going to replace time zero with time t. And then they're going to be, it's going to be an r1 and r2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate everything. So I'm going to, we, I'm going to, the total translation distance between the upper two pieces will be R1, and the total translation distance between the lower two pieces will be R2. So I translate everything, I then do, I then do the same business. Um, let's call this U plus and U0. Um, and the gluing equations are going to look like this. Okay, so you're going, to, you're going to be able to glue up to, up to two elements of the co-kernel with u0. So you're going to have like a, a theta for here, which you can get to be 0, a theta here, which it lives in a one-dimensional vector space, and a theta there, which lives in a one-dimensional vector space. I continue to identify this one-dimensional vector space with R. And the gluing equations are going to look like, um, so I'm going to have um, e to the minus lambda minus R um, plus e to the minus, sorry, R1, plus e to the minus lambda plus R, Sorry, it's going to be an eta, this will be the eta, same eta as before, plus e to the minus lambda plus r2 
eta plus minus t equals zero, and then e to the minus lambda minus r2, eta minus minus t equals zero. So where does this all come from? Uh, so then what's lambda plus? So lambda, lambda plus is the um, well, largest negative eigenvalue of the Hessian, the Q. Uh, and eta plus or minus are determined by asymptotics of u0 at the positive and negative ends of u0. So this, this second equation is sort of is the same kind of thing I had before. That's the equation you get for this. Um, so there's a, here we're looking at the co-kernel of this. And there's a term coming from the asymptotic, the negative asymptotics of u0. And then this negative asymptotics is measured by this eta minus. Um, and then this, this exponential here comes from the fact that I'm stretching these two things apart by distance r2. And then this gluing equation, this eta is determined by the negative asymptotics of u plus. Then this eta plus is determined um, by the positive asymptotics of u0 over here. So those are the equations you get. And this is just, this, so these are simple equations, and now you can just analyze them. Uh, Why is there a thing with two exponential terms before and now, and it wasn't before, which is, I think maybe I just didn't understand that. Okay, so, so the first equation comes from this first piece, this middle piece here. The thing is this middle piece, we're gluing things to the middle piece on both sides, and that's why there are two exponential terms. And the second equation comes from this lower piece, and we're only gluing one thing to it, which is why there's one term. So in general, each piece has a gluing equation where for everything that's glued to it, there's something involving the asymptotics of that other thing, right? So like, um, if, if we're gluing these, these three chalkboards together, so this, this chalkboard, the gluing equation for this chalkboard has a term for the asymptotics of this chalkboard and, and a term from the asymptotics of that chalkboard. Confused as to what exactly the obstruction bundle and the section are. Okay, so in this case, in this case, um, it's a bundle over the set of all pairs R1 all triples R1, R2, and T. Um, and the fiber over a point is um, the co-kernel of D0 directs on the co-kernel of D0. Because now we're gluing two pieces which have co-kernels. So for each of those pieces, you have a sum end. This must be really fun to do for easy. Oh yeah, it gets much worse. Uh, but I won't do the worst part. So, so we're going to see later that a bun, an example where this bundle is not trivial anymore. It's actually a real interesting vector bundle. Anyway, with these equations, maybe it was a little confusing how I got to them. But now that I've written them down, you can just solve them. It's completely elementary. Um, So you can solve the gluing equations if and only if all of the above, all of the following hold. Um, so first of all, 
a to minus and t had better have the same sign. Okay, because that's just looking at the second equation. If a, to, if a to minus and t, so this is, we're sort of fixing t. And the question is, can we find r1 and r2 solving these equations? So the second one can be solved if and only if these things have the same sign, and then there's a unique r2. Then you, then you have to look at the first equation, which is a little more confusing. Um, so... Uh, So we're uh, saying that that's one. Doesn't that make d dt of vt minus one, which is the which is what we're multiplying t by in the equation? This reminds me of some nightmare I had once. <laughs> it's like I had some math nightmare about this, and it's reminding me about this. Um, <laughs> So I've sort of abstracted everything out so that so this, this minus sign has sort of long disappeared. So, I mean, for, you could just forget about this. Let's just call this, you know, like F or something. So this is the equation that I'm trying to solve. Um, and, and then I'm identifying this with the co-kernel. Um, and then everything, so I sort of trivialized the co-kernel, identified everything with one. And then these are, these are some real numbers determined by the asymptotics. I don't know if that helps or not. I mean, a priori, I have no idea what the signs of these numbers are. It depends on the asymptotics of the, of the flow lines. So basically, like you're saying, you know, am I, am I approaching the critical point from this side or from that side? Um, and then in, in some obscure way, by that, by that identification over there, one of them is actually declared to be positive and the other is declared to be negative. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you can figure this out. So, um, uh, well, maybe, it, maybe it's not necessary to go through the whole thing, but, but there's, there's some more conditions for the second, for the top to be able to solve the first equation. So, so in this case, um, and then when you look at this first equation, it's actually going to matter. So so it's actually going to matter which of these two eigenvalues is bigger than the other. So let, let me spare you the whole thing because I'm just going to confuse myself trying to do it. But there are more conditions. And in some cases, uh, these depend on the sign of um, the difference between these two eigenvalues, which I'll add to my list of generic genericity assumptions that this difference is not zero. Um, so, it's, so, so the, answer, the question of whether or not you can glue, it depends on the relative signs of eta, eta minus, eta plus, and t, and also on the sign of the, this difference of eigenvalues. So it's like four different signs. So there's sort of 16 different cases. And you can just sort of go through and check each one by elementary methods. It's ex I worked out all the details on this blog posting. This is the one from? Uh, July, July. 2014, yeah. Or at least I worked out the algebraic details. So the analytic details, if anybody likes analysis and wants to understand this stuff better, it could be a good exercise to do the analytic details, so sort of to justify all these facts. Um, and work it all out. So, so we did this in the paper with Taws for holomorphic curves, but not in this Morse theory case. But I should also mention that the uh, thesis of Jia Yong Li um, 
does some polyfold version of this for certain holomorphic curves. I haven't actually seen the thesis, but there's some, there's some related polyfold thing by, by, by Jiao Li. Okay, so anyway, the upshot is um, we have this configuration we want to glue. We reduce the question of whether we can glue these to solving some elementary equations involving real numbers. Um, and when you can just solve them, um, you, so, for, so you may or may not be able to solve them. Um, in general, I can tell you what happens. So, uh, there's sort of three possible outcomes. It's just kind of curious. Um, So let's suppose I want to glue to k copies of the flow line from Q to itself. So, so case one is you can glue only for k equals one um, and only for sort of one of the possible signs of t. That's the simplest case. Case two is you can glue for all k for, say, for one of the signs and none for the opposite. And case three is you can glue For k equals one for one sign, uh, and k equals two for the other sign. Those are the three possible outcomes. Remember, we were supposed to get a polynomial, which was supposed to be one plus t to the plus or minus one. So in case one, you get the well. I mean, you're sort of you're sort of seeing a one plus t there. In case two, you're, you're sort of seeing a one plus t plus t squared, dot, 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 which is the inverse of one plus t. And in case three, you're, you're seeing something like one plus t squared divided by one plus t, which in z mod two coefficients is one plus t. So you are getting the correct polynomial. Although this third, this third case is quite weird, but it, it can happen depending on what these signs are. Um, and you get this, um, so which of these three cases you get may depend on what flow line you're trying, what flow line you plus you're trying to glue, but you always get the same polynomial, the same, same power series. Um, so, yeah, so I didn't, compl I didn't explain, I didn't go through all the calculations, but I hope the base, I explained the basic idea of how you sort of, how you try to glue these things and you, you reduce it to some elementary equations which you can then solve. Are there questions about this? So I think I have 10 more minutes, is that correct? Yeah. All right. So let's just forget all this and start over. <laughs> so if, you're, if, you're totally, if you got totally lost, we'll just start over. We just forget about all this. Can I ask just one question? Oh, yeah. So, like you said, it depends on whether the thing comes from one side or the other side of the court. What does that mean? How does a critical court have sides? Um, well, so here's the, here's the critical point Q. Here is an eigenspace, or uh, this is an eigenspace of the Hessian. And if this is the sort of the smallest possible eigen, smallest positive eigenvalue of the Hessian then the flow line u plus generically is going to either come in like this or it's going to come in like that. So it'll come in along this, along this, this eigenspace plus some exponentially decaying error terms. So that those are the two sides. This is a little counter to your usual intuition in Morse theory because usually you, you, you think of a stable or unstable manifold which is, has dimension bigger than one. But when these eigenvalues are distinct, there's a preferred direction, a preferred eigenspace the preferred line along which you approach the critical point. 
So that's actually the generic situation. Well, usually you, make, you want to assume the opposite in Morse here. Usually you want to assume all well, the eigenvalues are the same. It makes it easier. But that's not a generic at all. Uh, what else are you going to do? <laughs> it just seems like you'd have a lot of algebra equations to solve. When you... Oh, but I knew, what the, I knew that d squared equals zero. Because it's the same as Sadbury Witten, and d squared equals zero in Sadbury Witten. I mean, sometimes you know something's true, even though you don't have a proof. Then you just have to work out the proof, and it comes out. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so now let me, let, let's just switch gears and talk about the holomorphic curve problem I care about. So I'm going to introduce the problem and then we'll talk about its, how to solve it tomorrow. Okay, so we're going to look at a three-dimensional contact manifold. So Y is a three-manifold. Lambda is a non-degenerate contact form. R will denote the ray vector field. Um, and we'll choose uh, J will be a suitably generic, meaning sati satisfying an ever-increasing list of desired conditions, um, almost complex structure. What did you call it? Suitably desired. Desirable, almost complex structure. Uh, well, desired might not be generic, but. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make sure your, your desires are achievable. Um, <laughs> what? Comedian. Your desires need to be Comedian. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can imagine doing it like a dating website. Like a, I'm looking for a Comeager partner. <laughs> See how many responses you get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, Right, anyway, so, so we satisfy the usual conditions, which this is a little, this is a special case of Chris Wendell's talk, but I want that the, um, the J sends the derivative of the S direction to the ray vector field. J sends the contact structure to itself, rotating positively with respect to the orientation on it. Um, J is R invariant. Okay, then we're looking at holomorphic curves. Again, a special case of Chris Wendell's talk. Uh, And these will, so sigma is a punctured, compact Riemann surface. And the ends are asymptotic to ray orbits. With, with um, S going in plus or minus infinity. Um, so these are, these are the kinds of things that one wants to count in the SFT differential. In my case, I count them in the embedded contact homology differential, but I'm not going to assume any knowledge about either of those things. I just want to talk about gluing these things um, in a particular situation. Uh, yeah, I put that here. 
It's okay. Sorry? Uh-huh. Yeah. Make a dating site for theorems and proofs. Oh, that's a good one. I, I could put a I could put a bunch of entries on that one. What? Theorems. I could put a bunch of theorems on that one looking for proofs. <laughs> I don't really have so many proofs looking for theorems. <laughs> Um, okay, so, you know, if you, so here's, here's the problem, I, here's the problem we've got. So, is to glue along a branch cover of a trivial cylinder so a trivial cylinder means r cross a ray orbit so you could have a holomorphic curve like this so this has index equal to 1 so it lives in a one-dimensional moduli space, which means that after you mod out by the R translation, it lives in a zero-dimensional moduli space, assuming transversality. So this, um, so the usual kind of gluing would be, you know, two of these things might break like this along some ray orbit, and you want to glue them, uh, or maybe they break, maybe they break along multiple ray orbits like this, and you, and you want to glue them, and that's a, that's okay. You can glue these. Um, but the problem that can come up, so you can glue the you can glue these two things to get an end of the moduli space of index two curves. And the problem that can come up is you could have a sort of three part curve where you have a index one curve on on the top, you have an index one curve on the bottom. Um, so this index one curve has the simplest case. It would have a uh, negative end at gamma squared, where gamma squared means the, the double cover of some simple ray orbit gamma. And this lower curve has um, two positive ends, both at the ray orbit gamma. And this curve is index one. So it looks like you can't glue these because the they have different kinds of ends, so there's no way to put them together. However, you can insert in here a pair of pants which is a two to one branched cover of the cylinder R cross gamma. Um, and it turns out that 50% of the time, depending on some conditions, which I'll tell you later, this, this, this pair of pants has index zero. Um, in general, it has index either 0 or 2. Um, so sometimes it has index 0. So this whole configuration is index 2. Um, and you could say, is, can this whole configuration be glued to an end of the index 2 moduli space? And the answer is, yes, it can. And you could say, how many ways can you do it? Uh, in this particular example, the answer is one way. And you can see that by looking at an instruction bundle. So I'm out of time for today. So what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to discuss um, just, just this, this simple example um, of how to, how to glue this using an obstruction bundle, which in that case will actually be a, a non-trivial bundle where it's not, just, um, it's not just the same fiber over every point. It's actually interesting. Um, and then I'll mention the issues that this raises when you think about the definition of the SFT differential, because this means that 
certain configurations involving branch covers of trivial cylinders must contribute something to the SFT differential. So it'll be interesting to compare when we see the definition of the SFT differential next week. All right, so, this, so next time I'll talk about how to glue this. That'll be my, my last example, thanks.